All right, welcome back. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the nuclear envelope and the nuclear pore complex. So to start off with, let's stop and think about the nucleus itself. If you recall from general biology, the presence of the nucleus is the key feature that distinguishes eukaryotes from prokaryotes. If you recall, prokaryotes are thought of as a big open bag that holds all of the proteins, all of the DNA, and everything happens in that one space. Now, that's an oversimplification, and prokaryotes definitely have a lot of organization going on there, but it's not achieved by membranes. In eukaryotes, that is achieved by membranes, and there is something unique that can be capitalized on in eukaryotes because of that. So, in eukaryotes, um, the nucleus serves as a repository for that genetic information, but is also acting as the cell's control center. And the reason why I can do this is because all of that DNA replication, any transcription, and all of that RNA processing, such as putting on the five prime caps, the poly A tail, all of the alternative splicing that can take place, various trimming, all of that happens inside of the nucleus. That final version of the messenger RNA is then transported out of the nucleus, and only that final stage, translation, is happening in the cytoplasm. So that's opening up a lot of unique um, ability to control how we do this process, okay? Something that prokaryotes can't do. So, when a prokaryote creates a messenger RNA, it can be, and typically is, already started being translated before the entire messenger RNA is even finished with transcription. So, if you remember, you know, those messenger RNAs are coming right off the DNA, and while it's still attached to the DNA, and you have the RNA, um, proteins up there churning away, the ribosomes are already attaching to the front end of it and starting to translate those proteins. In eukaryotes, we have a bunch of steps that need to take place, and by sequestering them in the nucleus, it allows us to control how we express genes in very unique ways. So, for example, we have this thing called alternative splicing, right? Um, and with alternative splicing, we can take a single gene, we can transcribe it, and then we can process that messenger RNA in one of several different ways, creating one of several different proteins. By putting that all in the nucleus and separating that from the ribosomes, it gives us time to actually do that. And so now we can save a little bit of space, have more proteins being able to be produced from a single gene. We have different versions that can be produced. Also, by limiting access of proteins to the genetic material, we can also set up a, a more complex system of gene regulation control. So, for example, we have all these transcription factors that are needed to initiate um, transcription. If we put those out in the cytoplasm, we can have them respond to some type of signal coming from the outside of the cell. They then have to travel to the inside and then turn on that gene, right? So it's giving layers of control that can, that can be utilized. So keeping in mind that, and I've said this many times before, that we are 95% the same genetically as a mouse. It's typically not the difference in the genes itself. It is a difference in how we regulate those genes. So the nucleus is providing this structure to create the separation 
that allows us to amplify the amount of complexity that we can uh, regulate. So coming back to our learning objective here, uh, looking at the structure of the nuclear envelope and the structure of the nuclear pore complex. So here is our nucleus. Inside of this nucleus, we have all the various chromatin. Remember, chromatin is a combination of DNA and proteins that that DNA is packaged up in. Remember, there are two meters of DNA in each one of our cells, and it has to be packaged up. Wrapped around the outside of this, we have a membrane. And if you look closely here, you can kind of see that there are little channels going in and out. And those are what we call nuclear pore complexes. Now, if we zoom in on this membrane a little bit, what you'll actually see is this membrane is not a single layer. It is actually a double layer of membrane. So we have an inner membrane, we have an outer nuclear membrane, and you'll, if you notice, the outer nuclear membrane is actually continuous with the endoplasmic, as endoplasmic reticulum. So when a cell goes through replication and we see that nucleus disappear, all that membrane just becomes part of the endoplasmic reticulum and it comes back. And the initial formation of this idea of a nucleus probably happened after the endoplasmic reticulum was already a thing. And it just utilized that membrane material to do a new job. Here you can see that there's something called a nuclear pore complex, and you can't see it clearly here as a channel because we're looking at it sideways, um, but it is in fact a pore that goes through. So here is an electron micrograph of that, and let's stop and take a look at a more of a cartoon version of this because here we can kind of amplify on or, or point out some particular characteristics. So here again, we have an inner membrane. We have an outer membrane. And if we look around to this side here, we can see that the outer membrane is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. This does create kind of an inner membrane space that we call the paranuclear space. There are, in fact, pores that go through. And if you look at uh, this inner membrane here, you will see that there is a network of fibers underlaying it. This is something called the nuclear lamina, and it is made up of proteins from our cytoskeleton. Here you might also start to see some other features, okay? Notice that the DNA that is represented in here, or the chromatin, is connected with this nuclear lamina, or it appears to be connected. Also notice that there are specific subregions within the nucleus, and we'll come back to that again, but recognize that there is quite a bit of organization um, that is going on here, and a lot of that is being achieved by the presence of this nuclear envelope itself. So again, just to recap, the nuclear envelope consists of an inner and outer membrane. That inner membrane has the nuclear lamina underlying it, which gives it strength. Remember, membrane is just a drop of oil. We need the proteins to give it structure. Um, the inner and outer membranes are joined by these pores, which allow things to travel in and out, such as transcription factors coming in or messenger RNAs coming out. The nuclear envelope is uh, continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. It is all one membrane system. And in between the inner and outer membranes, we have this perinuclear space. And this perinuclear space is actually continuous with the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's all one inner thing. So let's stop and take a look at the nuclear lamina. 
This again is the filamentous meshwork of, in this case, intermediate filaments that provides the structural support. Remember, the, the membrane itself is just a drop of oil. We need some type of structure to give it its appearance, um, and this is a, achieved by these intermediate filaments. If you recall from general biology, we have three different types of filaments within our cytoskeleton system. We have the microtubules, we have the actin filaments, and then we have the intermediate filaments. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about microtubules and microfilaments, and we'll be coming back to different elements of this again. Here, we're going to concentrate on intermediate filaments. Now, these intermediate filaments are built up by these individual individual subunits and there is uh, several classes of these intermediate filament subunits each type being uh, associated with a different type of application and in this case laminin is one that is associated specifically with the nuclear lamina so this protein has um, a central alpha helical structure that has these globular domains on each end. Two of these proteins will associate together to form what we call a coiled coil, where they wrap around each other, forming a dimer. And we actually see this coiled coiled uh, type of motif uh, reoccurrent in, in biology. This is a very common method for joining two proteins together. Um, but in this case, what it does is it creates this individual dimer unit, and these globular domains can interact with the coiled coil domain, and this forms this tetramer arrangement. This tetramer can then be linked with other tetramers endwise where these globular uh, ends associate with each other forming these long filaments or more aptly named a protofilament. Okay. These individual protofilaments, four of them come together creating what we call a protofibril and four of these protofibrils come together to form the actual intermediate filament. So here you can see that it's a, a very complex structure, but it's very reminiscent of braided rope or braided cables. So we definitely didn't invent that. Uh, we just reinvented what nature already did. Uh, here is a comparison of a couple different types of um, intermediate filament subunits, or dimers in this case. Uh, so we have laminin A, which we've been talking about, and here's a, another one. This is more associated with um, cytoplasm um, intermediate filaments. And the major difference that you see here is laminin, since it needs to be inside of the nucleus, has something called a nuclear localization sequence. And we will come back to this and talk about that a bit more. So here's a close-up image of um, the nuclear envelope. Here you can see a nuclear pore complex with the uh, inner membrane and the outer membrane. And these lines in yellow are meant to represent the nuclear lamina underlaying the inner membrane. Something that I wanted to point out here is that that lamina is cross-linked to the membrane itself via proteins that are uh, transmembrane in nature. So we have transmembrane proteins in this inner membrane that reach out and connect to this nuclear lamina. Here we have two examples here of uh, emerin and laminin B receptor. Those are both uh, transmembrane proteins and reach out and connect with the nuclear lamina. And this is what helps tie the membrane itself to this structured network of fibers. 
In addition to these, we also have a series of proteins that are called sun proteins that are part of this link complex. So in this link complex, we have two components, a sun component and a cache component. And you can see that the cache component is transmembrane on the outer membrane and actually makes contact with the cytoskeleton in the cytoplasm. So this is something that is cross-linking the nuclear lamina with the rest of the cytoskeletal elements. And this is done through this link complex. Now, to point out here, sun isn't a particular protein. It is a class of proteins. And uh, cache is a class of proteins. So there are several members in this class. The thing that they have in common is they have a sun domain and a cache domain which directly interact, okay? Uh, so let me give you another version of this, showing you some differences here. Um, so here we have a series of proteins. Uh, this line here is meant to be the inner membrane. Here we have the outer membrane, and this is the perinuclear space. You can see that these, all these different sun proteins are uh, transmembrane and that they are connected directly to the nuclear lamina. You can see here that the cache proteins, which all have a cache domain which directly interacts with the sun domain, we can see we have different varieties here. One that is interacting with actin filaments, one that is interacting with other intermediate filaments in the cytoplasm. Here we have some interacting with microtubules. So you see this is a vast network that is tying all these pieces together. Now, going back to this image here, another thing that I wanted to point out to you is these uh, striped lines here are meant to represent chromatin. And again, this is a a combination of, of the DNA and proteins that help spool it up. And I want you to recognize that the chromatin is making direct contacts with the laminins and these transmembrane proteins. And this is part of a system of organizing the DNA within the nucleus. So if you can think back to what cell cycle looks like and the condensation that occurs in chromosomes, thinking about the organization that has to occur in order to prevent that from tangling. I mean, just think about a corded pair of earbuds. I mean, just that in your pocket gets tangled and it takes you a minute or so to detangle it. Think about two meters worth of DNA put into an infinitesimally small little spot. So the, the, the possibility of tangling is huge. So what we have is a system within nuclei that helps keep this organized. So one thing that you'll notice is that centromeres would all be located within a particular region. Telomeres would all be located within a particular region. And something for you to think about here, remember that telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes. They require a special type of replication for, that, for those to replicate. It would actually make a lot of sense to keep all those ends together and to keep the telomerases all in one spot. To get a little bit more detailed here, here is a close-up here we can see the inner and outer membranes of the nuclear envelope we can see the nuclear lamina underlying it and these lines here represent chromosomes and here we are showing a couple of different version or a couple of different types of chromosome so here is heterochromatin which is tightly packaged non-used dna so think about a the DNA for the enzymes for the liver in a neuron, right? They don't need it, so they can take all that DNA and package it up tightly. The regions that are expressed are in these big loop regions 
that are sitting out in the open. And so now we have a paradigm where heterochromatin, transcriptionally non-active, is connected to the nuclear lamina. And then we have these transcriptionally active out in the open, right? And these are regions where we are producing messenger RNA from. This is our euchromatin region. Here we also notice a, a region that you may have noticed before, which is the nucleolus. Um, later on in the chapter, we'll talk about localization of things within the nucleus. But I want to touch on it briefly here quickly. So the nucleolus is where all of the processing for the rRNA, or the RNA that is in ribosomes, takes place, right? So that all happens in one spot. Um, and we have other small nuclear bodies that are specialized functions, and and go even going back to this image here of having all the telomerases in one region, having all the centromeres in another region, is another example of that. So we have a lot of specific organization, um, and we can see little subregions that are essentially transcriptional factories. And this helps explain why particular regions can gain such high access to the proteins needed, such as the, the RNA polymerases and those transcription factors, is because they, they never really leave this region. When they, when they fall off, they're hanging out in here, and then they're ready to go back on to another site. So recognize that even though there isn't defined subcompartments in terms of membrane, there is a lot of organization within the interior here. And this is actually a very good paradigm when you when you think about prokaryotes. They aren't just an open bag. There is a lot of organization within. It's just not achieved through membranes. So, of course, we have the nuclear pore complex, and this allows shuttling of things in and out of the nucleus. And we can either get things in or out through a passive diffusion, and this would include any small molecules, such as ATP, right? That is a fairly small molecule. It can just passively diffuse in and move in there. It doesn't need to be actively transported. Larger things, such as proteins, need to be selectively transported through these pores and RNAs are selectively transported out. Now, the thing for you to consider is that this pore is not just an open hole. It's a little bit more complicated than that. There is actually a gel-like material that fills that pore, and this is made up of these um, Fg uh, nuclear porins, um, and the Fg comes from having phenylalanine and glycine repeats within these long um, linear proteins. They're, they're very uh, strung out. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of structure to them. And those hydrophobic regions interact with each other, forming a mesh. This mesh essentially forms a gel that makes it very difficult for proteins just to pass through. There's kind of a barrier there. So there needs to be something that helps shuttle it through this. And we'll talk in detail about how that system works. Here, let's just focus on the pore itself. You can see that there is an outer ring. It is an eight-member uh, ring. And we also have an inner ring. On the inner ring, there is a cage-like structure that we call the nuclear basket. This is another layer of barrier that is helping both keep stuff inside, but also acting as an attractant for things that need to be exported out. So there are binding sites along these proteins that, for, that help attract um, transport proteins that are there to move things in and out. Uh, similarly to the basket on the cytoplasmic side, we have these filaments that extend out. And these help to, again, attract those transport proteins 
and keep them localized in an area close to the pore itself. Uh, we also have these proteins along uh, the membrane itself. Here's a, a slightly more detailed image of that. You can see we have a system of proteins that are actually transmembrane that all form together to, to create this link um, or this ring. And then we have these gamma complexes that are on the inside and outside, these eight member rings uh, which form the boundaries. But here's an example of that FG repeat protein or that FG nucleoporin. You can see it's, it's just a long unstructured protein and it has these FG repeats, FG being the single letter codes for those amino acids, phenylalanine and glycine. Those tend to be hydrophobic in nature and those tend to cluster together, which is cross-linking this into a gel-like material. So I hope now that you can illustrate the structure of a nuclear envelope and give us some details on the nuclear pore complex.